Kimberly Carter with the closing podcast for the mini series on prison overcrowding and potential solutions. What I didn't tell you before is that much of the stuff I have addressed in the previous three podcasts I have personally experienced. For instance, I am someone who has literally served 20 years time, day for day, without a single day off for something that happened when I was 19 years old and was a tragic accident due to mandatory minimum sentencing and an inability to earn good time on 25 years of my sentence. Intensifying this even more is the fact that Washington State offers no option of parole for the majority. Sentences like this create a culture of motherless and even fatherless children. This is not good. Grandparents oftentimes raise the children, which is no easy task in their elderly years. But worse, children may also end up in the foster care system. I've personally only encountered two people whose foster care experience was positive and gave them love and fulfillment. Literally, Every other person I've encountered who has lived in a foster home was sexually abused. Sadly, one cellmate I had said she grew to expect sexual abuse with each new foster home she was moved to. Another grievous result of these unnecessarily long sentences is elderly family members losing their loved ones to incarceration. Many lose someone they relied upon for help in their elder years and then must go on suffering this heartbreak sometimes for the rest of their life. Even though I have used situations at this prison as examples of the overcrowding effect, Washington is only one state affected by this crisis. This is a nationwide problem with far-reaching effects. The worst and most horrifying instance of overcrowding I've encountered was in a California case called Brown v. Sada. Federal district judges ordered the state of California to reduce overcrowding due to the horrendous conditions. Living conditions were described as had to live in the gym, and mental health patients languished for years without treatment while suffering from hallucinations. With there being far too many inmates to assist with their mental health issues, their psychological state further deteriorated. In 2006, then-Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger identified a suicide rate approaching one a week and declared a state of emergency in the prison. Needless suffering and death were becoming the norm. Even more, the court found that it is an uncontested fact that one person needlessly died every six to seven days from medical neglect. Something like this should not be accepted in a so-called civilized society. It is barbaric and completely irresponsible. Just this month, on July 12, 2024, the courts are still involved in these issues because the state of California is not complying in releasing inmates. Decades have passed with no results. Just think about what is happening in California. The state of prisons there is a horror show, yet some live like this for years on end. Can you imagine being death to 
suicide and violence all around you? Surely this will cause even more severe mental health issues than what one may have had before prison. Couple this with the fact that these imprisoned people haven't been given help for the issues that caused them to end up in prison in the first place. In fact, they have been made worse and will now be released into society in this worsened state. Is this really what we want? Even the former warden of San Quentin said she, said she absolutely believes they are making people worse and that they are not meeting public safety by the way they treat people. Treat people, meaning helping people with their mental health disorders. The Brown versus Plata case further pointed out that statistical evidence shows that prison populations have been lowered without adversely affecting public safety in some California counties, several states, and Canada. Various methods, such as good time credit, diverting low-risk individuals to community programs, and even parole, are available options. Options Washington State does not employ concerning long sentences except in very limited circumstances. As we can see, several things are contributing to dangerousness in cities today, which include not treating the issues that cause someone to end up in prison to begin with, families and children repeating cycles of recidivism, and poverty, which has always been a motivator of crime. Someone needing to pay the bills or feeding their family is a real phenomenon. So maybe we could help people with their treatment needs, whether that be from alcohol or substances, and attaining job skills, rather than causing an out of control overcrowding problem that only makes prisons and society more dangerous. Rather than seeking vengeance, it would help tremendously if prosecutors could be more responsible in who they prosecute. Maybe there is one person listening right now who could help make a difference with some meaningful change. Reducing prison population increases public safety because this leads more vital mental health and treatment resources for the ones who need it most. Without overcrowding, staff will be less jaded and overworked and more available to help people become better and safer to themselves and others before being released. People will get out. Do you always want them to be their worst moment for someone who has improved? Essentially, our judicial system has caused this out of control issue that is plaguing our nation. And it is safe to say that overcrowding increases recidivism. That concludes not only this week's discussion, but also my mini series on prison overcrowding and potential solutions. Thanks to everyone who has listened. If you want to reach out to me directly, I am an inmate at the Washington Correction Center for Women, and you can email me through Secure. My name is Kimberly Carter, DOC 815-679. Thanks for listening, everyone. Take care.